Um, well, in Western Australia, we actually undertook some significant rule changes uh, probably around a decade ago uh, to make sure that we didn't have the problems of branch stacking continuing uh, to be a problem in Western Australia because there was concern of that. And we changed our rules to avoid cash payments for memberships as well as a number of other uh, changes that were taken at that time. Uh, so I am uh, reasonably confident, at least to my own knowledge, that uh, that we don't have that problem uh, occurring as we've seen uh, reported in other states uh, happening in Western Australia. On the issue of Western Australia, you've said the Prime Minister should be keeping his nose out of WA state matters in mm. relation to the Federal Government court intervention into the border dispute. You've even gone as far as say, to label Scott Morrison as being a big bully when it comes to this issue. You have a legal background. Surely you have respect for the advice being given to the Federal Government that the border closures uh, are not lawful, that they are in fact unconstitutional. Well, that remains to be seen, and it's Clive Palmer who's brought that action of all people against the state of Western Australia. But I think what everyone would have to agree is that Mark McGowan, as the Premier of Western Australia, has done a fantastic job in managing the COVID-19 uh, crisis for the people of Western Australia. And we're now down, I believe, to only two active cases in Western Australia. And a large part of being able to manage that is being able to manage the flow of people in and out of Western Australia. Now, the, the state government's been very constructive in the way that it's managed that. It's still ensured that industry and business have been able to continue as much as possible by ensuring that in particular our resources industry is being able to get on with the job of keeping the economy going as much as it can, not just for Western Australia, but indeed the entire nation. And what we've seen now as a consequence of those great decisions is that the economy is reopening in Western Australia faster than it is in any other part of the country. Our restrictions have been lifted faster and that's enabled businesses to start reopening and get back into uh, you know, creating jobs and making sure that people who lost their jobs or were stood down are able to get back to work. So the decisions taken, including closing the border, have been very positive. They're very positively regarded by the people of Western Australia and it's important during what is still a continuing health crisis across the nation, that we take all the appropriate steps. And I think the last thing anyone in any business or any individual across Australia wants to see is a second wave. And so I think it's important that the Western Australian government, based on the health advice it is receiving, is taking prudent steps to make sure that there's no second wave in Western Australia. And that ensures that when businesses do reopen, that they're able to stay open and that they're not put at further risk. And in the discussions I've been having with small businesses across the country, largely via video, in my capacity as the Shadow Minister assisting for small and family business. The biggest fear businesses have is a second wave. And the other thing that they're concerned about is as they reopen, is whether the business actually returns. Are people happy to come out and come into their shops and uh, engage with them? Now, we've seen pretty positive steps around that, but that, that is a concern. And the safety and environment of safety that's created by having the strong border in Western Australia is a critical part of that for Western Australians. Now, for Scott Morrison to then be standing uh, over here in Canberra and shouting at the Premier of Western Australia, shouting at the Premier of Queensland, shouting um, at other state leaders about, oh, well, you should go and open your borders. I don't see Scott Morrison opening an international border, by the way, um, because he knows that that would be the wrong thing to do. And part of managing that is making sure that there's proper requirements around who moves in and out of states. Now, obviously, those state borders are going to come down in time as is appropriate. And because the caseload in different states is different, that's going to happen in a different way in every state. So I don't see why, when Scott Morrison tries to talk up you know, this uh, unity around the national cabinet that he's created, he then walks out of those meetings and then starts bullying premiers via the media and via press conferences. It's not appropriate. He doesn't need to do it. And what's the most important thing is that we keep people safe so that we can enable these businesses to reopen in their own jurisdictions first, and then we can look at how we reintegrate all of that across the Federation. Well, the uh, local tourism sector is disagreeing. We've seen a new analysis today showing that on average uh, there's 42 jobs a day being lost every day that interstate visitors are banned. So the economic imperative is certainly there to get them opened ASAP. We are almost out of time. I do just want to ask you about your portfolio. You've written a piece today about the need post 
COVID to really look closer to home when it comes to making defence industry supplies. You make the point in this article that if just 10% more of our defence industry spend wound up in Australia rather than overseas, we'd see an extra $2 billion spent in our economy annually. If you were the minister, would you be committing to procuring a specific portion of supplies from Australia? Is a protectionist stance really what we need right now? Well, one of the key problems we've seen from this government in managing defence industry is that they haven't made any firm commitments at all about making sure that proportions of those spend on major projects are actually happening in Australia. They've got a best endeavours clause with no actual requirement that provides no guarantee to Australian industry. And crucially, it doesn't see the necessary development of our sovereign capability here in Australia. And as all of the issues that have arisen through COVID-19 have shown, we need to have a stronger local manufacturing base here in Australia. The capacity to do that is presented through defence defence industry. We've already got a lot of money being spent and the government needs to do more to make sure more of that is being spent here in Australia and developing those businesses and developing that supply chain locally. And we've been very critical of the government for not having firm requirements about delivering on that when it comes to future submarine, when it comes to future frigate, when it comes to a whole range of projects that this government is spending $200 billion dollars on over the next decade. So this is what we're saying. The government needs to develop some firm requirements that are enforceable against these large international companies that are providing these projects to make sure that they actually deliver on engaging small and medium businesses here in Australia. They need to come up with that and make sure it's in those contracts as a requirement. They're going through a process of finalising contracts at the moment for example, with the future submarine, and they need to make it an enforceable requirement that they impose. Now, we're not the ones in government yet. We're not the ones drafting the contracts. These contracts will be finalised well before I might be lucky enough to become a relevant minister in this area, but the government needs to do the work. And as I pointed out in the piece that I had in the paper today, just an additional 10% would see a $2 billion more going into the Australian economy every year. That could be supporting Australian manufacturing jobs, developing our sovereign capability here in Australia, and we shouldn't be missing out on that opportunity.